glory to God whose power working in us could do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have been um, following along with us, you will know that today is the, the fourth Sunday in Lent. And I certainly hope that you have been following along. It's also called uh, Laetare Sunday, which comes from the Latin word Laetare, which means to rejoice. So it's traditionally a time and a, a day of celebration, expressing joy, um, especially during this crazy time of Lent that we find ourselves in. I find this very, very appropriate. And that's why I ordered flowers for the altar today. Um, and I know there are altar guild people out there going, oh my God, what has Jim done? But during this time of the COVID, we've had to step out of what's normal and what is customary and what is comfortable. Today is also uh, 21 days before Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. And, and it's known as Mothering Sunday, Refreshment Sunday and Rose Sunday. And believe it or not, we are permitted to wear red vestments today, not red, rose, excuse me, not red, rose, that was a test, you guys out here failed. Um, it was rose vestments, and you know, we don't have any of those, but some of my, my esteemed colleagues do, and they're quite wonderful. Um, the picture you're seeing right now, this is the very Reverend Billy Alford, the Dean of our convocation. He's wearing a pink chasuble, which is awesome. The altar linens are also pink. Um, thank you, a big thank you to uh, Elena Freeman Gregory, who sent us these pictures. That's her on the bottom right there at the altar. Um, this is a time for us to, to take a quick break from the penitential season of Lent. Um, it's a pause. It's a pause for us to rejoice. And we do have so much really to rejoice about. And today, especially, we get to hear some very famous lines in scripture. Um, one of the most famous, in fact, it's called everyone's text, um, being the very core and meaning in the gospel of John. It is, of course, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that anyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. But we, if we're not paying attention, we could very well miss the first sentence of the gospel lesson for today. Um, Jesus here is referring to the Old Testament lesson which you just heard, and his, his audience would have recognized this story. And Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The people of Israel, you'll remember, were on a journey through the wilderness, and they were moaning and groaning and whining and regretting the day that they left Egypt. And you know what? Nobody liked God's cooking. They were sick and tired of being sick and tired of manna from heaven. They spoke against God, and they spoke up against Moses. They were a little disgruntled. So to punish their behavior, God sent a plague of deadly, fiery serpents. Ooh. Nasty, nasty, nasty snakes that bit people. And of course, the people immediately repented and cried for mercy. And I remember hearing about this story in Sunday school. And you know what really amazed me was the Sunday school teacher put me on the spot, me being a PK, a preacher's kid. He thought I would know the meaning of this story. And I did not know the meaning then. So God instructed Moses to create an image of a serpent and set it up on a pole in the middle of the camp. And whoever looked at the serpent was healed. And it was God who healed them by turning their thoughts to God. And when they did that, they were healed. What does that remind you of? That snake up on, it looks like a cross. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the cross and stuck it out there and the people were healed. The author of John took that old story and he used it as a metaphor to teach 
It's a foreshadowing perhaps of, of what is to come. He says the serpent was lifted up and people looked at it and their thoughts were turned to God. And by the power of that God, who they trusted, they were healed. Even so, Jesus must be lifted up. And when people turn their thoughts to him and believe in him, they will find eternal life. Now, the really cool thing here is the wording in John. It's a play on words that he has almost. It's like when you try to explain to someone who's not from here, who doesn't speak English, um, why we drive on parkways and we park on driveways. That makes no sense. We drive on parkways and we park on driveways. Or like when I ask you, are we on the same page here? If you take it literally, I'm asking, are we on the same page in the book? right? But it actually, or could also mean, do we have the same understanding? Are we on the same page here? Are we, under, are we on the same, or do we have the same understanding about this? So the Greek verb to lift up is hoopsum, and it has two different meanings. It can mean literally something that is, is lifted up, that is elevated, physically elevated, but it can also mean something that is being lifted up, is elevated, it, it, an exaltation, if you will, uh, being raised up or glorified. So there's, there's really two meanings here. And John, the author of John, plays with these two meanings. So here it's used as Jesus being physically lifted up to the cross. The Son of Man must be lifted up. But in Acts 2, verse 33, and Acts 5, verse 31, and then Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, it's used refer to the ascension of Jesus into glory, that the Son of Man is exalted 40 days after Easter. So in Acts, the second chapter, the second chapter in Acts verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both shall see and hear. Acts 5, 30, verse 31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior so that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And the second chapter in Philippians, verse 9, therefore God also highly exalted him, gave him the name that is above every other name. This is like a double lifting in the life of Jesus, the lifting of the cross and then the lifting into glory. And both, both are intimately connected. They're both woven together and one could not happen without the other. What if Jesus had said no to God? No, I'm not gonna do it. I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna do that. I wanna continue to be a carpenter. He could have taken steps to avoid this whole thing altogether. I mean, he had a pretty good life going. It would have been easy for him not to go and just to say no. But Jesus did not say no. Jesus had not, if Jesus had not chosen to follow God's path, there would be no exaltation. For him, there would be no glory. And it's the same way with us. The exact same way. We can choose the easy way. We can refuse the cross that every Christian is asked to lift up but there would be no glory. It is something that we cannot change. If there is no cross, there is no crown. Both the lifting effects mean salvation for us. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life in him. Our lives changed by our believing in Jesus. In the Gospel of John, the verb believe is used more than in any other New Testament writing. It's a verb. Verbs are action words. It's implied action. We are participants. We're not one sitting in the audience watching a show. Instead, we are the ones leading the way. We need to lift ourselves up to be elevated with Jesus. And yes, even exalted. Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
And during Lent, we're asked to check in on our belief. And remember, it is God who can heal us so long as we turn our thoughts to God. And that is something that is worth rejoicing about. Amen. Amen.